Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Ashanti Carter, and I serve as the Director of Community College Partnerships at Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science. And what you saw was a video about Ms. B.B. Moore Campbell. So this month, July, is named in her honor. It is now called the National BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Denise Shervington of CDU. So thank you so much for joining us. In the lion's den, Dr. Shervington, introduce yourself to the people. Thank you. Um, let me say how honored I am to share this space with you. And you look so very vi vibrant that you're already <laughs> destigmatizing what it means to be healthy and well. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and also a public health practitioner, and I'm the chair of psychiatry at Charles R. Drew University, where we both belong. Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome to our friends at blackdoctor.org. Welcome to our esteemed medical students of Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science and all other stakeholders who are a part of the Mighty Lion family. Thank you again for joining us in the Lion's Den. So as we kick off uh, National um, BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month, we're gonna talk about the theme, which is culture, community, and connection. But today we're gonna talk about culture and the impact that racism has on our mental health. So of course we have to get the GOAT, Dr. Denise Shervington, to talk about this. This is what she does. So Dr. Shervington, let's jump into it. Talk about racism and its history. What is racism? And why should we, why should we study it? What is that? What's racism? Um, a social construct. So let me begin with that. Um, it has nothing to do with the biology of who we are, but certain groups have decided to create a hierarchy of human value to which power and resources are attached. So if you're not part of the preferred race, the superior race, then you're perceived as lesser than, and then there's institutional power to keep you in the space of oppression and trauma. And, you know, that's a fancy way of saying, really racism is about thinking that other people who are not in your racial tribe are not good enough, they're not deserving enough, and you're actually going to create, as I said, institutional policies and practices and have a society in which those who are not part of the group, so the BIPOC community, we are really considered lesser than and treated lesser than. And we've seen what's been happening recently as a reminder of that. Yes, indeed. And we are going to talk more about what, yes, and that's the dismantling of affirmative action. So thank you. So with um, racism, there's this notion of white supremacy. So how do the two interact? What's white well, supremacy? Yeah, it's the belief, um, I would say a delusional belief that people of white ancestry are superior to those who are not. Now, some of that is founded in um, doctrines that have been used to take other people's lands, um, to colonize and to oppress, and for us as Black people to put us in conditions of enslavement that were extremely subhuman and to expect us not to search for freedom. In fact, there was a mental health condition that's called dreptomania, when enslaved peoples were trying to run away and seek freedom, they were told that they had a mental illness. It was dreptomania. And the treatment for that was to whip the devil out of them 
and ultimately to kill folks as they search for their freedom. So we have a very horrendous history of racial trauma from we were taken away from, you know, our African lands. So you mean to tell me that a person who is saying, you know what, I don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve to be treated this way. That was flipped to mm -hmm. say, you know what, you have a mental illness because you do deserve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And wow, I learned something new. So that that goes into uh, really with American society. And when we talk about um, communities of color being from a very collectivist community and then with um, American society or even white society being more individualistic. Can you just talk about how those two societies or at discourse, especially as it relates to mental health? As part of the human species, we are wired to be connected. We are interdependent. We're social beings. In fact, if we weren't cared for and nurtured and loved when we were born, touched, fed, we wouldn't survive. So I think we have forgotten in current, the current society in which we live, how much we depend on each other and how much we need each other. The, the pandemic, for example, an example of the strong desire and need as human beings, we have to be connected. And when that gets interfered with, the experience of being isolated is really very, very difficult for our psyches. As many indigenous peoples have known that, that we cannot survive except in community, except collectively caring for each other. I think we've taken a really, I think, harmful turn over the past couple um, centuries where we think that we can be individualistic, that we can survive on our own, we won't. And so as I, it's easier for me to talk about the diaspora, the black diaspora experience, we have survived, we've made it to this point. Um, B.B. Moore Campbell mentioned Harriet Tubman. We've had to care for each other as we continue to create what we experience as our freedom and ergo as our mental health. And that makes sense, you know, just caring for each other and not sweeping it under a rug or having, you know, as we just, as we are going to discuss a little bit later with mental health challenges, you know, it isn't anything to be ashamed of. So thank you for that. So you know, you you stated yourself, you're a public health practitioner, as am I. Yay, public health. So um, talk to us about, because we're setting the table, mm -hmm. talk to us about the social determinants of health. What is that? Mm -hmm. What are they? Racism. <laughs> I think we've Racism. created these terms, disparities, social determinants, to make it easier for us to not have to talk about, again, what this hierarchy in human value has done to society at large. Um, some people can't access enough resources. Here in Los Angeles, some people don't even have enough resources to not sleep on the streets. Um, I was driving home last night and Santa Monica, several people, sleeping on the streets. And I'm wondering, how does that work as a human society where we can be comfortable with such extremes of just basic care for each other? And so these social determinants of health, you know, the forces and usually the negative forces 
that influence you for where you live, where you work, where you play. They're all based on us as humans creating a society that's inequitable and built on valuing one group over other groups. Speak, speak, because that is so true. Housing, no one should be without a home. That That's just basic. It's not even a human right. It's just something I should have. It's a need. It's a necessity, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're absolutely right. So the American Public Health Association, and it, it goes back into what you said, the social determinants of health, it's racism, right? And so they said, you know what? Racism is a public health issue. So as we know that these things impact our health, how does racism impact the health of people of color? Well, you know, we talk about health disparities. We are these constructs that we, we have created as human beings where they impact our access to gaining the basic things that we need to survive. And to go beyond that, we are sufficiently technolo technologically evolved that we could, the majority of us could be flourishing. Um, so I, I just don't want to be at the base level of this, but it impacts how you access your daily survival. You know, you, you're worrying, I says the people who are, have to, let us just take a moment and think about in my day, I know it will end and I'll be wrapped in a blanket on the street. That doesn't sound right. Or I won't be able to access a meal. I, the basic needs. And so when people through these forces are in survival mode, then it really does negatively impact our mental well-being. Our mind if I might say so, is just the res subjective reflection of our brain, the brain being the organ in our body that's wired for survival. So we come to know our needs, the internal needs we have to eat, to drink. We then are able through our sense senses to see what's in our environment for us to get those needs met. And the mind is just always trying to negotiate how we get our internal needs met based on what's in our external environment. And if they're, if it's stressful, like for many people, the people who don't have a home tonight, don't have a meal, the people who know that the opportunities that they could have to sur better survive and to flourish, if you constantly have that stress in your body, it is going to impact you. And we have enough science now that it just does not impact your mental health. It impacts your physical health because your mind, our minds and bodies are one. The mind is just the one organ in our body that we know. And with the mind, it's telling things like our heart to mm -hmm. pump a little bit more. So, you know, that's why a lot of Unfortunately, BIPOC folk, right? Our rates of hypertension are actually higher compared to, you know, the, the white group. So uh, yes, what you're speaking is truth. So thank you. I want to really transition us um, now into mental health because you said something that pricked my ears. You said our mental health, it, it translates to our health. So why is it that folks, they kind of, they separate it. Oh, I'm healthy. Oh, but my mental health, this, that, and the other. What is mental health? And how do we go from a mental health challenge? How do we progress from that to a mental illness? I know that's a loaded question, but help us out with that. Well, I'm going to take the easy route and um, what neuroscientists have defined as the mind, as I said 
earlier, it is just the subjective awareness and reflection of what the brain is doing for survival, how it's managing our internal needs, trying to create homeostasis in our body in relationship to the world, the external environment in which we live. We have seven basic needs, um, effective needs in our bodies to be able to survive. And we're wired for that. And, you know, neuroscientists are saying the extent to which we get those needs met is the extent to which we are mentally healthy. And I'll tell you what those needs are. We have a need to be curious, to seek, to forage, to understand our environment. We have a need to be nurtured, to be cared for. We have a need when our needs are not being met to be angry and to be enraged because we could not survive if we didn't know where to get food, if we didn't have the drive. We also have a, a need, a drive for sexual desire. That's how as a species we've continued. We have a need to want to be, as I said, nurtured because as a human being, we will not be able to survive. If there's not something, we know, we know oxytocin is the hormone, the love hormone that a mother um, secretes in labor. And that is the, that makes the mother, us mothers, be able to put our needs aside and love our baby and care for our baby and attune for our baby. We're wired for that. We're also wired to play, to have joy. And the extent to which those needs are met are significantly defined the extent to which we will feel mentally well, whether we feel joyful or we feel um, not satisfied. I don't want to use a too negative term. But where we feel somewhere between hell and joy is the extent to which we, when our needs are met, we'll be okay. And so, you know, I, if we think about this within the construct of this externally imposed racist society or a society that's been genocidal, that's taken people's lands or a society where the immigrant who is suffering for whatever reasons and wants to enjoy the fruit of the earth and tries to be here, we create so much trauma. And on whom this economy depends? All those reasons, the extent to which those things further influence our seven basic biologically wired needs to a large extent defines how we are going to perceive ourself in the world, whether we feel we're mentally well or we're not. Now, there are some, you know, we're trying to find genetic codes and there might be um, some illnesses that are just genetically determined, but all the science we're seeing is saying that to a large extent, the environment plays a large part in our mental health. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So with that, when you're saying that the environment plays a role in our mental health, how can a person go, though, from a mental health challenge? Now it's a mental illness. What is that progression? We know that, unfortunately, a lot of mental illnesses have their root in early childhood maltreatment and adversities. We know that at, you know, up to the age of five, the brain is very plastic and is responding to the environment. And if the environment is hostile, we are at risk. Again, this is what the science is showing we are at risk for developing quite a few mental health conditions. So we have a lot of control. I guess I'm saying this, this is a very, to me, optimistic 
bit of science, if we can help to support early childhood, if we can help to support families so that early experiences of maltreatment and adversities are minimized, we're going to see less mental illness. Mm. And you said something that's key. You said family. So if we're living in a family of poverty due to redlining, lack of um, experiences, lack of opportunities, yeah, that does lead to child maltreatment. Those are things that that happen. I was reading in a, um, a paper once, it said that with trauma, it can even impact us all the way down to the genetic level. Is that true? Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. We know that traumas impact our um, hypothalamic pituitary level. We know it impacts the brain circuitry. We know it impacts the immune system. We know it impacts other organ systems, the GI system. And so if we're chronically living in toxic environments that create a lot of overabundance of stress hormones. In fact, I was talking to a child psychiatrist earlier and she said, you know, many of our children are living in their limbic brain, which is that part of the brain that is on alert to protect us. And it's ready to fight, it's ready to go into flight and or it might freeze. If we're constantly living from the space, and a lot of it has to do with the early environments in which we are in our home and the communities around us. It really can influence our health. The landmark study that was done, and it wasn't even done in, with black or brown people. It was done in San Diego with a primarily white educated middle-class um, group of patients who were attending Kaiser, um, they found Dr. Felitti and the group at CDC, when they compared the health records with the early childhood exposures, and now we call them ACEs, that if before the age of 18, you were exposed to adversities, depending on the amount of adversities, and they came up with 10, and if you were exposed to three or four or more, you were more likely to have mental health and physical health challenges. Um, yeah, it impacts, all of this impacts trauma, um, gets under our skin and it hurts. And it can be transmitted epigenetically. So we know that mothers who are pregnant during periods of stress, disasters, trauma. For example, the studies have been done with the Holocaust survivors. Studies done now with Superstorm Sandy, um, women who were pregnant. It was, it's been found that the offspring are more likely to be vulnerable to trauma-based conditions, anxiety, and depression. Powerful. Powerful, Dr. Shervington. That really takes us into our culture, right? American culture, BIPOC culture, and how we can make the change to destigmatize and also to become free, as you stated, to be free of the shackles of the illness and the trauma that we're passing along and it's cyclical, right? So there, I was talking to a coworker today and, um, you know, she asked, hey, how are you doing? So those of you out there in Facebook land, Zoom, all of that, even though Dr. Shervington is joining us from Los Angeles, I'm actually joining you from Washington, D.C. So it's after seven over here. And I'm in the process of relocating back to my home state of California. So it, it, it's quite stressful. And so she asked, are you okay? And I took a breath and I did hesitate for a moment. 
And I said to her, I said, uh, actually, no, I'm, I'm not okay. I think I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna take a day off because there's just moving across the state, mm -hmm. you know, just across country. It's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm working, and you know, for those of you who are students, yeah, I'm a student too. I'm finishing up my doctorate, so it's a lot. It's a lot that's going on, and it, it's. I tell you this because there's that stereotype of being a strong black woman, right? Mm -hmm. Being, um, you know, the Asian student that's so smart and perfect, being a hardworking person from a Latinx background. All of these stereotypes are so dangerous, right? Can you just talk about the danger in just, yes, this strong Black woman being a pillar of the community, and yes, yeah, she can handle it. What's the danger in that, especially as it relates to our mental health? Well, if we perceive ourselves as so strong, we're not human beings. <laughs> you know, as human beings, we're all going to suffer. Life itself is a struggle. And I think the best mental health comes from allowing ourselves to acknowledge the pain and the suffering, um, to know what's causing it, and then to have the capacity to say, I am going to do something differently. So there are this myth of strength and perfection that's not human. The universe, nothing in the universe is perfect. Um, I, I, I don't see, you know, we have seasons, it changes. Um, nothing is permanent also. And so this kind of static stereotype of who we are, we need to debunk that. There are times when, as you said, we're, life is stressful, it's the positive stress. There is, you know, stress that's not so positive, but if you go through it, you'll be okay. And then there is the toxicity of stress. And if we keep ourselves thinking that we're okay when we're not, we're not paying attention. And we're not knowing that physically our bodies are not doing so well. And our minds certainly are going to recognize that we're not getting what we need at a certain time, whether we need to step back and cure for ourselves the challenges around us. So that's something we should debunk. I, the word is overused, and but I mean it genuinely what it means. We have to be vulnerable enough to know that we cannot always be as we expect. Life is we turn up in the moment and we see what our reality is and react. And sometimes the environment around us is harsh. Harsh in a good way. For you, it's harsh, but it's good. You're coming back to your state, your city. That's great, but it's still harsh to get yourself here. And then there's some of the harshness, like what I experienced, the people in New Orleans, a hurricane, a disaster, no support, no love from the country, being called criminals, that's harsh, that's toxic. Very much so, very harsh, very toxic. And it's done with impunity, you know, where folks are labeled, are even labeled, I think they were even labeled as refugees. How are you a refugee when you're a citizen of this country? So yes, I remember Hurricane Katrina very well. Um, my father is actually from New Orleans. He's from Louisiana. I'm sorry, not New Orleans. You can say New Orleans. Louisiana. Yeah, <laughs> well, my dad is from, he's from Louisiana. But um, yeah, that that's, that's, that's something that we do have to debunk. And Jess, and I love what you said, making sure that we're vulnerable. And it's okay. And, and I think in a lot of BIPOC communities, vulnerability is sometimes viewed as being weak. And mm -hmm. that's another thing that we have to debunk. Where did that come from? Just like, oh, you're weak, but 
back in the day, you could rely on your girlfriend, your auntie, go and let them know, hey, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing well. And you had that support. Where did that come from? If you say something, you're weak. You know, I think what we see, we had to, as a people who were enslaved or a land state, no way, or, or search for new lands to have better opportunity, we're being blocked. We've had to create defensive structures in our psyche. Um, we had to do certain things to survive. You, you, in, in the Black community, you'll hear people say, just keep it moving. I mean, I've had kids where they witnessed a murder, seven years old, and went home and told their family. And it's like, don't worry about that, just keep it moving. We can't just keep it moving. We have to be vulnerable to the moment of pain and suffering and be with that and understand it so that the strength comes from figuring out the way through our pain, not by avoiding it. But we had to do that in survival. You know, you're this enslaved person trying to run away. You had to kind of keep it literally and metaphorically, you are trying to keep it moving. But now we're in a different, hopefully slight more opening for our liberation. And we don't have to continue to use some of those survival defense mechanisms that we had to and our forebears had to. We can claim, and this is what I love about young people and the Afrofuturists, Claim and reimagine a whole new life of freedom. Yeah, and there's freedom in being vulnerable. And you can keep it moving, but you mm -hmm. must first keep it real. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to keep it real and keep it 100. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling, you need to say something and it's quite all right. And that takes me into just this conversation about culture and with young people how does our culture just perpetuate unhealthy behaviors, especially looking at social media? How do we perpetuate that? Well, let me step back a little. And um, I work a lot with young people, work a lot with young people in New Orleans and to some extent now in Los Angeles. It takes time to be community, so I'll just, but you're coming back, you're going, we're going to do this. Um, and I think what I see is a normalization of adversity and trauma in our community. I mean, I was speaking with a public defender and we're discussing this case and a kid who's been through so much. And he said what really was startling to him, the kid thought I was normal, thought it's normal to see someone killed, to think it's normal to see someone shot at. And so we have a lot of work we have to do for children the ones less fortunate. And poverty is traumatic. I invite anyone to spend a week living in conditions that I have seen in the rural South and that exist right here in South LA. It's not pretty. It's grinding. It's traumatic. So in addition to the work that we're doing, hopefully to create a more equitable society, the norms that many of our children are going up with are to live in environments and communities with violence, where they don't get their needs met, where they can't go to a coffee shop, they don't have a park, they don't have all those things, the beauty that some of us have that help us to feel okay. And we are going to have to, I think, we're at a crisis point 
you know, we've hit another one of those. We need more Harriet Tubman's. I'm trying to figure out my Harriet Tubman stuff and everybody needs to figure theirs out. Or if there's another person in your culture that who was invested in liberation and freedom and put their own, didn't think about their own life. They were willing. She was willing. She went back 19 times to get enslaved people. 19 times. And she knew she could have been killed. But she knew she was called. And in our own ways, within our own metaphors in life, what can we do to help those amongst us who have not had access to some of the privileges that we've had? And this is why, you know, the work we do at CDU, um, our new students, we are going, are welcome to our new inaugural class. This is what you're being, you're being called to service. You're healers. You can't just see yourself as the upper middle class doctor who's going to do whatever. You might be, but please, I ask you to see yourself as a healer here to care for to love and support our communities. And in a time when we are so vulnerable, when we go seek medical care, we're suffering, we want help. Please see yourself as someone that, of service. Right, and in that vein, what you stated, just looking at the institutions and how racism has impacted those institutions, which is, you know, which also includes access to medical care. So yeah, you're you're absolutely right. So I I like what you stated. Um just talking about the the normalization of trauma in our communities and, and we can see that. And it kind of brings on a numbness, mm -hmm. you know, just numb. I remember before COVID there was always um, a shooting out here in Southeast DC, always a shooting. And it was just like, every time it would just hit me. Mm -hmm. And um, I was teaching at, for a dual enrollment program. And one of the students was just like, but Professor Carter, that happens all the time. And I'm just looking like, wait, like you're, wait, how are you numb to this? Like, you know, someone's that's somebody's child, someone's baby. But just looking at our culture, it's just like, eh, it's just something's just another day. Then when COVID happened, no more, no more shootings. I mean, we were all inside. Then now as we're beginning to venture outside, it's like, it's starting up again. Mm -hmm. And it's just, oh, okay, well, you know, that's, that's just how it is. Well, so what can we do? What can we do as the disruptors, you know, our social justice league? What can we do to just dismantle this? And how can we use social media or other forms of media to destigmatize mental illness and change the culture? What can we do? We have to turn up for each other. We have, so if we use social media, if we go in our communities, we have to have presence. Our kids, the kids whose brains have become dysregulated from their own confrontation with trauma in their present lives, or all of the generational trauma that has come into their existence, they need us. They need us. And I don't want to wait till the public defender calls me because Kid X has killed Kid Y over there. We need to get in front more in our communities and let the kids know that we care for them. I heard someone say the other day, these kids, they just don't care. And I said, I'm sorry, I think we don't care for the children. Adults are responsible for caring for children. They are not capable of caring for themselves. We are the ones who teach them to be humans. It's in the loving 
exchange and attachment between a mother and her child. And I use mother, I know there are other caretakers. I'm going to use mother. And I can't because I'm old. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to say mother, but I respect anyone else who is in that primary caretaking role. We need to be present and have our children in our gaze. When I worked with men who had previously committed crimes and were now interrupting crime, they told me two things. These men were amazing. They all said, when we were kids, no one saw us. We grew up in families where there's substance use, pe people incarcerated or caregivers. No one saw us. And so when we were about 10, 11, they called it typical New Orleans. We jumped the fence. I love the way we use words. They jumped the fence. They jumped out into another group of kids as dysregulated as them, but there was connection. So what would happen if those of us with a different story and adults who cared were turning up for children? And I know there's some great mentorship programs happening. I want to shout out a group here in South LA family where they go in and mentor young boys. It's called see a man, be a man. The, we're going to have to do that, whether it's in programs, whether it's just we go out. Kid, I was in DC once and there were some kids wiling out on the street and I looked at them. I said, look at my gray hair. You all get your act together. They went, whoa. And it's like, yes, we used to care for each other. The classic stories, if you did something wrong in school, by the time you got home, you would have 10 people lined up to spank you before you got home. I don't suggest that we use this kind of interpersonal violence, but we have to let our children know they belong to us. They belong to us. Absolutely, because without them, there is no us, you know, they're the next generation. And speaking of that, because you, you touched on so many things, Dr. Shervington, as you talked about families and substance misuse and all of those things, um, as it relates to just, uh, just mental health, illness, diagnoses, who, what's the treatment like? And is there a disparity that exists between the groups of who's treated and who's not treated? We don't always have to have clinical care to be mentally well. Let me make that really clear. Our environment has so much to do with how we perceive our mental well-being. As I said, how we get our needs met. Nature is very important to us. A sense of awe and you know, curiosity about life, that helps us to be mentally well. But say something happens, adversities come. Um, we have to create an environment in which we communicate to each other that it's okay to seek help. It's okay to get help. We've had a lot of horrendous things happen to us. Again, I can talk of the Black experience in America where, you know, these asylums were places they just locked us up because we were considered criminal and lesser than. So I know we are a little bit paranoid and, you know, just because you're paranoid don't mean that they're not trying to harm you. So I know we have a, our paranoia is a little bit up about mental health care, but there are many of us trying to change that. Um, and it's our responsibility as mental health providers to be welcoming and warm. We're the ones that should be destigmatizing mental health, making it known it's okay. This is just another organ system in the body. It's the one you know, you know, when your pancreas isn't working, you don't know your pancreas isn't working. But when your mind isn't working, you know it's not working. So it's good and bad. But we need to say it's okay to seek help. And for us, unfortunately, oftentimes we are misdiagnosed. And these are some of the things we're gonna to have to correct as clinicians. 
a little kid who's been traumatized, a black, and I'm going to use the stereotype, the black boy who's in the classroom, and we say acting out, do not diagnose him with ADHD until you have done a history to understand whether or not, or where his trauma comes from. Because, and why that's important, all the kids I meet in the juvenile system were diagnosed with ADHD. And you know what that did to them? The full story of their lives were never available. And the therapy they would need to heal those wounds they never got, because we just give them medication. Medications can help, but they cannot solve and help you understand how to manage the traumas in your life. So you might come to me and because you're a little bit dysregulated, I might give you an SSRI, but I can't just leave you at that. I have to help you to work to understand what are the issues that you're facing, the stress wars, and help you develop the self-awareness to be able to manage them. That's what our kids need, not to be labeled and misdiagnosed, but to get the kind of talking therapy that will help them. And we now have the science that shows that talking therapy changes brain chemistry. So it's going to re-regulate your brain as you begin to understand how the circumstances of your life brought you to the situation you're in. Absolutely. The misdiagnosing, I'm with you on that. I am with you on that. Let me pause just to let our audience know we do have about nine minutes left. If you have any questions at all for Dr. Shervington, please use the Q&A box to input your questions. We will do our best to try to get to them. Um, so when you spoke, Dr. Shervington, about the next generation of clinicians, um, what advice would you give to a person of color who wishes to pursue a career in psychology or even psychiatry? Go for it. <laughs> Come to CDU or go to an HBCU. Certainly, um, we do need practitioners amongst us who understand what it is to be from a minoritized, oppressed, marginalized group. You don't have to, if you have not come from one, then you have to be very humble. As I say, I work well with white clients because I'm humble. I let them help me to understand their particular cultural needs so that I can help them. And, but, but you know, on the surface, it seems easier for us if we go to someone who understands our circumstances. So we need more of us to be out there with our children, with their families, to help to support our mental well-being. So yeah, definitely um, encourage anyone who has an inkling, is curious about the mind, how the mind works. Go become a mental health professional. You'll enjoy the ride. It's, it's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful experience to have someone come at a certain point in their life when they've almost given up and you can help them to find the internal capacity to feel hopeful again it's a beautiful thing it's like you know um i guess the same when you know there's a physical illness and you help someone heal it's the same joy and beauty um, being a clinician who works with people with challenges, mental health challenges. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. So with Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, just with the wonderful work that we're doing in South Los Angeles, how can schools like CDU work with the community to educate the, the, the public about mental health challenges, and even providing resources to help? Well, 
starting with what you're doing now. <laughs> we and we, of course, CDU, I think, is known for or is special for having community faculty who are part of the academic experience with us and who, you know, are very rooted in the community and are almost in a transition translational role and as are they are as important to the university as those of us who come with academic the classic academic um kinds of i guess degrees but we we also you know we don't have a hospital per se and provide clinical services, but we have a lot of partners in South LA and beyond that we work with, um, where there are resources for mental health care. Um, so, you know, I don't know if someone wants an immediate referral, but certainly um, there are departments of psychiatry, there's the Department of Mental Health, that has clinics in the city, um, in South LA, they're the hospital, the MLK hospital close by. We work with Harbor, UCLA, and uh, we work at Kedrin, a community uh, mental health center that has a wide array of clinical services from inpatient hospital services to outpatient. They see children, so they're, there's not enough, but we we are working towards that. But there's th th no one should feel that they cannot get services. The Department of Mental Health committed during COVID that everyone could, should be able to access mental health care within a certain short period of time. And certainly, if anyone is struggling, there is the national. Um, crisis hotline 988. So I just wanted to let folks know that that's immediately available. And one should be able to, through the Department of Mental Health, see services that hopefully are accessible and available within 72 hours. Wonderful. Thank you. We do have a question um, in the chat. And it reads, how can young people create more innovative ways or spaces to support each other with mental well-being, such as via peer support models? Yeah, there's a whole new effort now to educate um, the generation, the sorry, the population at large. Um, it's called mental health first aid and not and first aid's just their crises but the good the goodness in that is that it's teaching about some of these common mental health conditions that young people experience i also want to warn just kind of have us not jump too quickly to say you know kids are mentally unwell you know i think there are lots of things going on in the society that needs to be managed for children. So I don't want to make it seem as if everybody is struggling, but there's a lot of need for care. In terms of peer support, I would recommend then that there is the, 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 the tenets of supporting someone is to listen to naively and just lovingly listen. So if we can create in, in our circle spaces that we allow each other as a, say you're, you're young, 18, 19, 20, 25 year old, to be open and willing to allow someone to be vulnerable, to share, to talk, to do things together again, you know, there are times we need to talk and there are times we need to be. There are times we need to be out in nature. There are times we need to take a walk. So I don't want to over pathologize mental health um, and to let folks know there's a lot we can do to make ourselves 
well and to support those amongst us. So whoever asks that question, reach out to your friends and say, what kind of, how can we support each other? Do we want to, there's training to do the youth mental health um, first aid and there's trainings to do teen mental health first aid if it's that serious but in general how about coming together and showing up in love and caring put the phones down for a minute get off social media put the phones down connect be there in person it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful thing yes indeed thank you so much so I do have one last question before we close. So I apologize for going a minute over. So um, you talked about hmm, the social determinants of health and how it's just racism. So I'm, I'm just going to tell the people. Education is one of the social determinants of health. It's an institution that really it's the most important one, right? And we have the decision with um, the Supreme Court of the United States dismantling affirmative action. And we know that the social determinants of health, it does impact our health. So with this dismantling of affirmative action, we know that education is a social determinant of health. How will the health of people of color be impacted by this? It could That's go a spicy right. one. <laughs> it could go wrong, but it could go right if we all felt responsible to teach each other. So some of the time, you know, some of our music we're wasting on, I don't want to, I'm not someone I like certain kinds of music, but there's a time we had liberatory music. Um, the country I come from, Jamaica, there were songs of Bob Marley was about freedom and finding, you know, ridding ourselves of mental slavery, seeing ourselves as human beings deserving. We have to turn to our arts. I think we're going to have to turn more and more to the arts, to our music, to our dance, to help us learn more about who we are. And we can give books, you know, we, maybe we need to start giving each other books. We need to stop watching Netflix. We need to start reading our history. If I hear anyone talk about what they binge watch on Netflix, that's a book you didn't read and history you did not learn about your people. We're gonna have to teach each other. And we did that. What are HBCUs? When they kept us out, we found a way to educate ourselves. It's their loss. They're, they're so much better when we are in spaces of knowledge with them. If they don't want us, fine. We're going to take care of ourselves. That's the attitude I've gotten up to this. And you're right. Education determines health. Many of us have um, ancestors who didn't have classic Western knowledge, but they were amazingly brilliant. And that's why we're here. Can you imagine thinking about how to liberate yourself from the master's whip? That was kind of hard. And here we are. So I don't want us, initially I was in despair, but no more. I feel riled up to say, what can I do to make sure we stay educated, we know about our history, and we can dream a more beautiful future with our freedom. Right. And to all of the prospective students out there who are looking at careers in healthcare, just looking at, you know, affirmative action. Hey, you know, Dr. Shervington is right. Schools like Charles R. Drew University of Medicine and Science, we're a private university, but boy, oh boy, do we have a lot of scholarships. I'm kind of embarrassed to say we have more opportunities than students. So, you know, if this is something that you want to pursue, look at our school. You can check us out on www.cdrewu.edu. We do have um, admissions counselors waiting to, to hear from you. But um, thank you, Dr. Shervington, for joining me in the lion's den. And thank all of you for watching. My name, once again, is Ashanti Carter, and I serve as the Director of Community College Partnerships. And boy, oh boy, do we have a treat for you next week. 
guess what we're going to be talking about? The second theme, which is whole, no, no, no. So it's community, then, no, it's culture, then community. So looking at the healthcare community, because you know what? They're heroes, but they need help too. We're going to talk about mental health of our healthcare providers. So it's a conversation you don't want to miss. Thank you guys again. Thank you, Dr. Sherrington. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Any last words before we before we say goodbye? See, supported. We can do this. We've come this far. We can keep going, but we have to believe in each other and ourselves. Our freedom comes from our connection with each other. I truly believe. So we can do this. That's right. That's right. Thank you guys so Ready. much. And, right. and have a wonderful one. Stay on, Dr. Sherrington. Okay, okay. everybody.